huge thank you to CIBC for making We Get It possible. Good evening, everyone. It is not evening here, but it is evening if you're watching this live at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, my name is Karine. I'm the program director with Young Adult Cancer Canada, and this is a new episode of We Get It. We Get It comes on every week, and we have all kinds of guests. Sometimes we'll have young adult cancer survivors, patients, supporters, and sometimes, like today, we have some colleagues and friends health professionals uh, who come to, to an episode to talk about all kinds of topics. And that's going to be some of what we're going to do today. Uh, to start to give our little description, weekly description. So today I'm wearing my hair down. I have dark hair about shoulder length. I have a jean jacket on and it is spring. So it's the first day of spring was yesterday with the equinox was somewhere in the weekend. So I am wearing a jean jacket. I am in my home office. It is a beautiful blue sky in St. John's, Newfoundland today. So I'm extremely grateful for that. And I am uh, with Bonnie Elliott. Um, Bonnie is a therapist, a counselor uh, in the Ottawa region. And uh, some of the work she does uh, is super interesting and I feel is going to be of interest to all of us. So today, me and Bonnie are going to talk about narrative therapy. Uh, and explore a little bit of what is it and how can it relate to the young adult cancer experience and help people. So that's going to be, in a nutshell, what we're going to talk about. Bonnie, thank you. Thank you and welcome. Thanks for having me. I really, uh, I enjoyed our meeting a couple of weeks ago and I was really looking forward to being on the show today. Um, I'm here at my home office in Ottawa, where I've been working mostly virtually. I work in private practice, and uh, I do have an office in the Glebe as well, but it's mo since the pandemic, I'm not seeing a whole lot of people in person, so working more from home. Mm -hmm. And um, a sizable chunk of my work life has been focused on kids and families and groups of people impacted by cancer. Uh, I worked as a pediatric oncology nurse way back in my in my 20s, uh, a nurse practitioner and a health coach and a group facilitator. Um, but these days I work more generally with uh, people and with couples who are coping with things like loss and transition and around relationship stuff and sexuality and healing from trauma. Trauma? Sorry, not drama, trauma. <laughs> I still see That's people. Same, in, but, you know. <laughs> I still see people impacted by cancer, but in a broader context of life and love and loss. And to me, that feels more balanced. Actually, um, there's a lot of burnout in oncology, and but that's a conversation for a whole other day. <laughs> we should have you back and talk about yeah. that. I would love to yeah. talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, in my current work, I also mentor other clinicians, which I really enjoy, and I teach yoga and meditation. I love facilitating retreats, bringing people together to heal and connect. And what I really get excited about is helping people get unstuck. You know, unstuck so they can live more fully, so they can have deeper and more satisfying connections with other people, but also with themselves, because at the end of the day, you know, we have to have that good relationship with ourselves. And I love writing, which enables me to find truth and beauty in my own experiences. Sometimes I don't know what I feel about something until I've written about it. So, so yeah. that's kind of where I come from. I come from a family of storytellers. Um, so what is narr narrative therapy? It was yeah, first no, that's what I was going to ask, because in just your introduction, before I let you really fully jump in, mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I really love your blouse. So Bonnie today is wearing this white in blue blouse that is quite stunning and very springy. So I really like it. Um, I, as you were talking and because you and I spoke about that together, uh, I do love how um, you are not um, necessarily, you're focusing kind of on the whole person and the whole experience and not just the cancer related part. And I think that's where there's definitely some connections in uh, in narrative therapy, storytelling, stories we tell ourselves, and Absolutely. all of the space it can take. Uh, so I think for those of you watching, I would say after talking with Bonnie a few weeks ago, some of what we're going to discuss today is so useful for all of us, regardless of if we've been ourselves for a cancer diagnosis 
or if we have been supporting someone going through a cancer diagnosis, I think some of those perspectives uh, are quite helpful. Uh, personally, I feel they're quite helpful. So yes, Bonnie, I interrupted you, but let's dive into no what's alternative therapy. <laughs> So what is it? Yeah, what is it? Because, and you know what? People ask me all the time, what is narrative therapy? And I never explain it the same way twice because I think it depends on the context and the person. And there's a lot of language around it. Um, it was first developed in the 1970s and 80s. And I have to give credit to an Australian social worker, Michael White, and David Epstein, who came from New Zealand. And, and they were influenced by a philosopher named Michel Foucault who looked at the idea of social construction, constructivism and, and how we, what we often think of truth is, is constructed by our social reality and, and the, the culture that we're raised, the time that we're raised and, and, and how we can sometimes change our lives more than we think we can. Um, so I was first introduced to narrative therapy when I was working on a First Nations Reserve, which seemed appropriate because it's very much in keeping with traditions around storytelling and reclaiming identity you know, um, personal identity. Mm -hmm. um, and then later in my university training and, and my ongoing supervision with Dr. David Paré, um, we've always worked from a narrative reflecting team process. So that's that's what I know. It's very collaborative. It's very um, multi, multi storied and stuff. So, so I feel very privileged to have had that background. Yeah. Um, and in a nutshell, I would describe narrative therapy, there's lots of ways of describing it, but as an approach to psychotherapy, but also to working in teams with other helping professionals, that is based on the premise that we're all meant to be the hero of our own story. But our personal narratives often get lost in these dominant social narratives about who we're supposed to be in all these different roles in our lives. So whether it's as a woman or a mother or you know, a person of a certain age or a person living with an illness, you know, we, we have all these, uh, all these other stories out there. And what about the things that we do that have that are not, you know, that are not in keeping with those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. so narrative therapy is about reauthoring our, our own stories in ways that are consistent with our personal purpose and values. And what I like about it is it's a very strength based approach. You got to remember, I was coming from a medical model, which was very prescriptive and very, you know, kind of I'm the expert and you're the patient. But although that's changing, I should, I should, in all fairness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but narrative therapy is not about me making a diagnosis and prescribing a one size fits all treatment plan, but it's about us working together to shift the relationship with the problems that you identify. So, for example, I work with a lot of couples who may be transitioning to a brand new role when they become parents. And they might be struggling with the weight of all these expectations that they've internalized from society and then from each of their families and their own childhoods about who they're supposed to be as parents. And that can be crushing because they want to be good parents. They want to be the perfect parent. You know, you can't be the perfect parent, even, you know, and would you want to be like, you know? <laughs> Um, so often at times a part of our work together from a narrative lens is to clarify what's truly important and meaningful to them. And some of that may fit with those expectations, but some of it might not. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, I know it's the idea that they're going to co we're going to co author their own story about who they want to be as parents. And a lot of times that's way richer and more authentic and more meaningful, you know, than than just following, you know, this is this is what I think it's supposed to be. Kind of. The roadmap yeah. by other people. Yeah. Because as I'm listening to you, even though we said at the beginning, even if you're working with cancer patients, mm -hmm. it's not going to be all about their cancer because you just kind of said we come from a variety of past experiences, past relationships. But as we know, cancer in itself in our life and in our societies mm -hmm it holds a big space in the disease spectrum. And so the preconceived ideas, the beliefs, the everything attached to it, there it's pretty massive because everybody, I would say everybody has known someone who had cancer. So it comes with, so those who get diagnosed, and I'm thinking of course of the young adults we work with and for, it can come attached to a whole lot of, 
things that are not even founded from the person itself. It just comes from what they heard and what they were told. Exactly. exactly. You know, I, I found narrative therapy really useful for working with people impacted by cancer because in our society, we have all these dominant narratives about health and illness in general. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of our narratives around cancer are very fear-based disease and death and suffering focused about cancer. And, and, you know, when someone's living with cancer themselves or they're, or they're accompanying a loved one, people around them make a lot of assumptions sometimes, and, and they can be incredibly like for one stereotyping but also disempowering and marginalizing and and they're, they're contradictory so so for example you know we expect that you know um a, you know we want people we say, oh you know you have cancer you've got to fight you know it's a battle and at the same time we expect them to be like passive and patients and sick you know like like those those two things don't even jive with each other mm -hmm. and then we and then there's all these expectations of what someone with cancer looks like or acts like and um you know and then we have other narratives around how we offer care or don't mm -hmm. to people who are living with a health condition and then and then all of these narratives intersect with other narratives like you said about you know what it means to be a person of a certain age or gender and you know the experience of cancer or caring for someone is often excluded from the narrative about what it means to be like a parent or to be a, a working person or a university student you know there's no script like you know there's no there's no place in in those roles for for making um making it work when you're dealing with treatment or when you're struggling with you know the impact of past treatment or whatever it's you know we have all these sort of boxes that we try to put people in and and you know it's not that's not necessarily to burn the boxes but it's to bring our awareness to what else is possible you know because from so i've been working with young adults for 15 15 years now or something like that and a part of me feels like you have these dominant stories so i guess before i started to work with this population i had certain stories i had heard of those big dominant either superhero type of cancer survivors, you, you know, do everything. And that's yeah. what you hear a lot about. And also the flip side of the really hard, sad stories. So the in-between, because to me, when you talk of pe putting people in boxes, I have seen as many boxes as I've met people. Like exactly. that, you know, everybody has their own stories, but mm -hmm. often when I talk to our community members, uh, they feel either adequate or inadequate comparing their story and where they are at in their cancer experience to mm -hmm. other people and then to other people's expectations and to their own expectations. Yeah, exactly. I've talked to people that have said, you know, oh my God, I feel like I should be starting a foundation and fundraising and really I'm just trying to survive like I'm trying to get through the rest of my life and you know be a parent to my kid you know like like yeah so we have all these you know we're not not everyone is Terry Fox and and not everybody needs to be Terry Fox you know no, no. and it's yeah and I know that for for people who have maybe less close experiences with cancer or someone with a chronic disease I think often the natural, it's not to, to mean any harm, but the natural instinct is to kind of go towards the big stories we've heard before. So either people from cancer, oh, they get all better and they climb mountains or people who have cancer, they don't. And so all of these kind of, it's almost like with narrative therapy, I guess you allow people you work with to mm -hmm. redefine, to rewrite their story so it, it, it is more resonating with who they are, correct? Absolutely. And, and I find that, you know, what I, why I find it powerful in relation to cancer is that, you know, the experience of cancer is for many people a life changing event and, it, and they often, you know, there is often a reexamination of values and meaning and, you know, some of the most reflective, fully alive people I've met have faced something truly difficult like cancer in their lives and, and you know, often it means that you decide you know, the way I was living my life wasn't congruent, it wasn't aligned with what's really important to me or the people who are really important to me, mm -hmm. or, you know, 
And so, you know, I mean, I, I hope that we don't all have to get cancer to, to, to make those realizations, but often people who have had to face something, you know, it's like, yeah, this is this job that I had that was taking all my energy, maybe not so much, you know, maybe it's about the people, maybe it's about, you know, this other little thing I was doing that I'm really passionate about that I want to do more of, you know. Yeah, maybe. And it's interesting how you put it, because we have met many young adults in our community who, after going through cancer, realized that their initial career path yeah. uh, was not going to be what they were actually going to do. And I know it can be destabilizing, like it can be a bit overwhelming at first when you thought you were going to be professionally mm -hmm. whoever you were going to be. And then that kind of loses its meaning and its sense. But ultimately, through narrative therapy, it, it is really to figure out from where we are now and who we are now, what fits the best. That's, you know, it's not so much, I can't do that anymore. It's, I, it's not fitting. It and, and our stories have multiple chapters, right? Like, so, so maybe that was a meaningful chapter of your life that, you know, your, th your, your values have changed or your experiences have changed or the way you look at the world has changed. So it's nice. it's time to write a new chapter, you know, like, sorry, sorry about the writing metaphors. But <laughs> no, but I, I do love that because I think as well, it, it may, it can help us make peace with, has things changed? Because as we know, people living with cancer and in our young adult community, for many, they had all kinds of hopes and dreams and everything is forced to get adjusted multiple times. But to your point, many chapters to this book and wherever we are at specific times in our lives, whenever that changes, it's not to regret or think that we were going, doing, going at it wrong. It's yeah. just kind of say, okay, well, I guess that chapter is done and I'm going to start a new one yeah. and it's okay. and yeah. often people come to me because their relationships are changing you know that that they they discover that people who were who they were very close to you know for whatever reason weren't able to stay connected with them through that experience and that's a real loss you know and and then there's all these new relationships that people develop when they're when they're going through it, an experience like cancer. And and so that those things shift your story too, right? The people that you're traveling with in your life. And, yeah. Yes, relationship is a, is a really big thing uh, in our community. <laughs> and, and to your point, it involves some grief and uh, and it's, it's hard sometimes to not get our story yeah. uh, changed because of exterior experiences. It's, yeah difficult to separate the two exactly and to say that well that's their story it's not you know it feels very personal but it's not actually it's not actually about what's going on with me and so i know it could probably be weeks for you yeah. to explain but let's say so we're talking about relationships we're talking about the cancer experience and in relation to narrative therapy can you kind of get it Take us through a little bit of some of the steps you can take with someone to yeah. let dead relationships, for example. I think it's yeah. a pretty common experience. Well, I was thinking about that while I was preparing for today. And and um, so, you know, narrative practices aren't as, they're not a standalone kind of self-help, like, you know, like some other approaches to therapy, because we reconstruct narratives through dialogue, you know, in a session. But, you know, there are a lot of useful personal explorations that can arise from those conversations, whether it happens in session or whether the person, you know, goes home and has, you know, does some writing or has a conversation with, with people in their lives. And one of the things I want to talk about is um, it's a key practice and we call, we call it externalizing the problem from the person. Okay. So let's say I'm, let's say I'm coping with something like anxiety. You know, and 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 uh, you know, anxiety. I mean, with COVID, everybody's you know, anxiety is like a huge thing right now, right? But it can almost become part of our identity. You know, like so, I might refer myself to it as an anxious person, or other people might ref might describe me that way as well. And what happens is that that becomes sort of an internalized dominant narrative, and it, it makes it hard to see the times where I'm not anxious, or or I do really cool things in spite of being anxious, but 
But if I can externalize it from other parts of who I am, it makes it easier to have a relationship with it, which creates room for like growth and change. And um, the one, so that's one uh, example. There's another one that I use a lot in terms of relationships and it's called the internalized other interview. The, the language and narrative is sometimes a little a little uh, too too unwieldy but so what I'm what I might do so um, if a person is having trouble seeing themselves in the most compassionate um, kind you know uh, realistic way because we, we're all very harsh critics or not all but we often are very harsh critics of ourselves sometimes I'll ask them to actually speak about their experience as someone they've known or, or still know. So it could be someone who they've admired, who has passed on or, or someone in their life or, um, you know, sometimes they'll say, you know, if you could see yourself through the eyes of like your grandfather, and then I actually interview them as they play, they sort of speak as the grandfather. And it sounds, it feels awkward for the first two, three minutes. It's like, but then something happens and it, and it's really rich and they're able to see themselves from another person's perspective and they're able to see their strengths in a way that they might not be able to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll say like, you know, you know, and I'll ask like the grandfather, you know, like, what is it that you've noticed about, you know, John and how he's handled this? And he'll say, you know, like, like, oh my God, I've noticed that he's so, you know, despite all these things that are going on, he's, he's such a generous guy, you know, so people like, it, it takes it to a more real thing than just words, you know, mm -hmm. and it's often a very moving experience when we do that. Um, and sometimes I also, but sometimes I do it about not another person, but a concept. So I interviewed, uh, we had a, a practice group once and I interviewed my colleague as grief and she spoke as grief like the people most of us had lost someone recently and it was the most powerful experience so it was, it was like I was talking to grief and she was answering as grief would answer and I don't know it was it, it was it was just it, it takes things to it takes the conversation to a, a deeper place when you have when you can externalize things like that you say like that she because I'm listening I love this like I love that you hit on anxiety which is massive huge in our community so many of our community members are coping with a lot of anxiety and I've heard them describe it I've described myself like that before as I am and yeah. as I am this and that so I love that you hit on that but in this last piece I can almost see as well so the self-compassion element where often they'll say talk to you like you would talk to your best friend mm -hmm. or how your best friend would talk mm -hmm. to you and to do that piece, but would you say you can also have those conversations with your younger self, which absolutely, like, yeah, uh, yeah, you yeah. know, talk to what would young Kareen say to Kareen today, or you know, what would Kareen today say to her young self? To yeah, kind of just re restructure stories in our heads. Exactly. Yeah. And we can do that in session as as like um, a conversation, but people can also write a letter. So I use a lot of therapeutic letter writing in my practice. So sometimes it, it could be me writing a letter to, to a client or a group describing the subtle changes that have happened through our work together. You know, and I, I talk from like a place of curiosity and compassion, but oftentimes people will go and write a letter either, you know, they might write a letter to their younger self or to someone who's been in their life, they may not even give that letter to the person, especially if there's a lot of anger. I've had clients who've written a letter to the cancer itself or to an amputated limb or to their breast and, and found that it was, you know, it was quite powerful in processing the trauma, but it also um, connected them with some other things like gratitude and, and, and joy that they didn't expect would happen when they were when they were writing a letter like that, you know, you'd think it would be very, it would be very dark. Um, so a letter writing um, is something that people, and it's something that people can do on their own, you know, like outside of session. And I, I had a client the other day who said she went home and wrote like a nine page letter to a, 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 a to a former partner. She, with, she wasn't gonna give it to him, but she said it helped her as she wrote it to sort of, to, to step outside of the experience and say, wow, you know, like, and, and when she had finished writing it, 
she just felt so much more at peace and centered, you know, with, with that relationship. So I had a professor, I loved what he said, you know, and I, I always hold it that the people live inside of us. You know, we have relationships, we have our external relationships with people, but we also have the, per, the part of them that, that we hold inside that, that transcends things like even death, you know, you, you know, we still hold, we still hold the people we love, you know, and, it, and it's possible to have like a conversation, an imagined conversation with that person, and it can be a real powerful resource, you know. Yes, I, and I love that you so much of this so obviously unbiased if nobody is cut on but i absolutely love maybe because personally and through therapy uh, at times not with someone maybe who has the same expertise as you do i've explored so you were talking about grief and i remember in one of a therapy session i did years ago um my my therapist was inviting me to uh so some parts of at that time in my life i was worrying a lot uh, about others, about all kinds of things, oh, everything. Really. Always things to worry about. <laughs> and, and she was encouraging me to give names to darker parts of me. So I didn't like to see myself mm -hmm. as a warrior. My mom worries, my dad worries, mm -hmm. I worry. And then that became my story. I'm mm -hmm. someone who worries. Mm -hmm. And giving a name to that and having a conversation with, I can't remember what the name, I think I... I can't remember what I called mm -hmm. worry, but gave worry a name and was talking to worry. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually externalized. So like you said, yeah. if you kind of yeah. took it outside of me for a moment uh, and then what followed for years after was really me slowly having a very different relationship with worry to the point of now not worrying much about trivial things but it, it was a process but I'm realizing today and as I'm talking to you it actually started with this invitation to how about we put a name to those darker parts they are in you those people in you there you know and start to have that conversation in that way I like the word invitation I also I've worked with people around the idea that when we worry about someone else it's actually an act of love Mm -hmm. Like we worry about the people we love. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's possible to shift that worry to, you know, like for, for some, for some people it, they switch, you know, if, the, if they, they might shift it to even prayer or they might shift it to, you know, I'm going to just hold that person in my heart for a minute instead of thinking about all the things that could go wrong with them, you know, so yeah, language is powerful and how we, how we change our language. Yeah. It is. Um, there's a lot more I want to say, but so would you say in, um, obviously, like, mm -hmm. I, we would tell anyone that it is not and I can see how it is not a one size, size fits all type of therapy that you can read a book and then you do it on your own. But I can also see so would you say writing is a big tool and instrument in narrative therapy? Yeah, it can be. Um, it can be for sure. Not everyone likes to write. Some people more like to talk. I have a I worked with a woman who would do videos. Um, the other thing I've used a lot, especially with children and with groups, is um, an exercise I call the we call the Tree of Life, and it's where people draw. They literally draw a tree, and the the roots of the tree can represent, you know, their their cultural lineage, their family, the things that they draw upon. And then the trunk of the tree is like their strengths and the way they show up in their life. And then, and then you know, the fruits and the and the leaves can be the, the things that they've created. And and then they their tree may be part of a forest connected with other trees. And you know, so it can be a really powerful exercise and how they weather different storms and stuff. So so I use so narrative can be writing. I use it as part of um, I do more some more experiential work like somatic experience experiencing and, and um, mindfulness and sand tray work. So I integrate it more in terms of, you know, how we are in the body or how we work with objects or, or um, you know, that mindfulness, self-compassion. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, for people who love to write, um, uh, I, I, do, I do find it really that letter writing and that can be useful, but everyone has their own way of processing things and right. connecting, yeah. 
There are all kinds of there are all kinds of avenues, I guess, because I can imagine that to mm. start to work on our story, mm. uh, to maybe reframe it so that it actually maybe fits more with who we are and where we are now, mm. uh, it it demands like an awareness and it demands to navigate mm-hmm. uh, beliefs and thoughts and you know that could be probably painful at times, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. ultimately can really lead to something, I would say maybe a bit liberating in mm-hmm. acceptance. Like, is it like, do you feel like as you get through this, like a part of me feels like through the years, I'm getting more and more into a place of acceptance with who I am mm-hmm. within the band. Yeah. Um, so that changes the story as well. I don't, I'm not as hard on myself than mm-hmm. I used to maybe mm-hmm. for some things I made peace with. And sometimes as we externalize things, we can accept them more. Like, like if I think of my, ang- I, I have a bit of anxiety driving over bridges, you know, so if I think of my anxiety as like a passenger in my car, who I want to make sure is safe and, and, you know, uh, watered and fed and, and doing okay, I'm a lot kinder to my, to that anxiety than I am if I think of it as like a weakness or, you know, or, or something that I need to push down or, or, um, fight on board. Yeah. Out of the car. Yeah. I mean, even, even sometimes, um, cancer itself, like if we think of cancer, you know, that I, and I mean, that, that could be a whole other conversation, but how we, how we live in relationship with, with uh, illness or disease, you know, do we think of it as this other, or do we think of it as, as something that that we are holding, you know? Yeah. We talked about identity and cancer with actually Denis uh, Raymond, a great, uh, that you would yeah. know. <laughs> but uh, yeah. he did, it was his master's um, I had his book right there, but we talked about identity and mm-hmm he shared with everyone. So it's an episode of We Get It, uh, where you can certainly uh, revisit for anyone watching. Uh, but it was around how he uh, looked at his terminal diagnosis, like he, with, with cancer, and then how it affected his identity and how he kind of figured out uh, his, his story, really. Wow. Wow, I'd love to read his story. Yeah. It's great. It's uh, well, I'll do a plug for Denis, but he has a book actually um, that is is um, is auto ethnographic essay, which is uh, what he did with school, and, and and it is quite interesting because to your point, we could certainly and maybe we'll explore that together. Have you back to maybe even just more specifically talk about living with cancer in the sense that with this diagnosis that. Mm-hmm can take so much space in so many areas of life uh, and really blurs like a lot of our community members sometimes say I'm not quite sure all the time why I am anymore uh, because I've been feeling so sick or in so much pain or lost so many friends or dreams or so it kind of really blurs the map Mm -hmm. completely Uh, so finding your way through that Mm -hmm. um, is not your own identity with and beyond cancer exactly like a lot of people will say I am not my cancer I was diagnosed with but I am not that but sometimes it can feel Mm -hmm. it's so much space Mm -hmm. that to actually figure out who you are underneath all of it can be um difficult but possible Mm -hmm. I I I love this conversation Bonnie um I feel like you and I touched on sense a therapy when we spoke for anyone obviously we're not going to get through describing everything oh, about those yes. uh, but anyone I hope there is curiosity do you have any messages you would like to like to leave us with about uh, narrative therapy or the power of story or anything you would like to leave to our people watching mm-hmm. I mean I think I'm, I'm at heart a storyteller I just I get to help other people tell their stories which is very cool um and I, I wouldn't say that I'm a pure purely narrative therapist but it's definitely the cornerstone of my work because I feel aligned with the idea of working collaboratively and that people are resilient that they're the experts of their own lives and and I what I appreciate about narrative which I you know maybe speaks to the times in which it 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 came about was this social justice aspect of challenging those dominant narratives around gender and culture and 
how we live our lives and you know and when and when someone's dealing with cancer they're they're that's that's a whole other layer you know of of, of, of what they're living with so so yeah it's all about it's all about it's all about stories right and 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 telling the the power of telling your own story you know and and putting it in a broader context of your life story and the stories of you know the people that you love and the other trees in your forest you know yeah I love that. We're all about stories. So we always put the yak information because profiles yeah. on our website and stories via video or writing mm -hmm. are um, read. The most read sections really still, mm -hmm. and they are powerful. And I love how you began our chat today talking about helping people get unstuck. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that for whoever is curious, it doesn't have to your point, it doesn't have to be I'm going to go do pure narrative therapy is just to know that there are ways for all of us to explore where we are. And I think often we could say when we're stuck is we're repeating the same story that is not serving us. It's yeah. just a story we've integrated and that we keep telling ourselves and others. Yeah. So we externalize it, internalize it, and then it's hard to see where you know so I think doing well and I think people get stuck sometimes when the story is changing because change is unsettling right like yeah. Yeah. and sometimes when people feel constricted I, I I often use the metaphor of you know how snakes shed their skin every once in a while I think I knew that tell me again <laughs> so every once in a while a snake will shed its skin like you'll see a little snake skin on the side of the road but I often imagine that just before that happens, that snake must feel awfully stuck and uncomfortable. And, you know, and I think, I think sometimes when we feel stuck, I, I actually get excited sometimes when people feel stuck because I think, oh, okay, you're on the cusp of something is uncomfortable in your life. And it's because you're, you're about to shift. The shift may be not so comfortable, but, but it's, you're tapping into something that you know that that you're you're starting to question things about the way you live you're, you're becoming more awake and more you know um more integrated so integrated. i love that and i love how and we'll wrap it up on this maybe i love how because sometimes I think our instinct when we start feeling uneasy and feeling stuck is associating that moment with something negative mm -hmm. because it's uncomfortable, because we feel like we're just spinning in mud and going nowhere. Often it's like, I'm so stuck in it. But ultimately I do love how you just said, well, really for anyone listening, it <laughs> might, we might feel stuck for a while. So it's not about the moment we feel but to know that, yes, when we start to feel uncomfortable in certain situations, when we start to feel like nothing is changing, the more we get connected to that, the more we get ready for this to shift. It's really like shedding our skin and, and getting yeah. a yeah. fresh one, really. And that things actually are changing, but they're just, they're not, it's, it's not at an observable level yet. It's just that you're, you're starting to crush them, you know, and, and yeah. Yeah. And an experience like cancer can definitely be a catalyst for well that's that. it. That's why we often say to our community members, like you go through even with the clash with friends and people around us, like when you're younger, especially, I would say you go through so many internal changes that nobody can see mm -hmm. all the transformation, all the realization, the perspective. People can't see it. It's not like, to your point, it's not like the snake exactly. And the skin is not falling with a, a new one. It's not visible in that way, but it's happening regardless. So regardless of if people see you change, internally, you are transforming. It's Absolutely. And I work with a lot of adults who are survivors of childhood cancer. And, and they often have, like, they, have, they often have tools for living and and you know not sweating the details and, and coping and not not to say that they haven't had trauma but but you know there, there's often a wisdom that comes from 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 having to figure things out you know yes mm -hmm. oh thank you bonnie it's oh this was fun it was fun. already for having me yeah it was really great. And to me, it opened up probably 10 doors of, of conversations I would like to have with you. So maybe we'll just explore that for anyone who's watched uh, the episode today. 
I hope it was helpful and I hope maybe it helps you and all of us um, look at ourselves and our story with a little bit more love, uh, knowing that it changes, knowing that nothing is permanently the exact same all the time and that there's help out there. If you are feeling stuck, there are beautiful people like Bonnie and others. We'll put Bonnie's information uh, with our episode today uh, to make sure you know where to find her. But then there are all kinds of uh, diff different services that we can help you at Yak Find if you don't know where to look. Uh, but certainly there's help out there if you're feeling stuck. Uh, and feeling stuck is not a bad thing. That's one <laughs> on today. So thank you again so much. And for everyone watching every Monday, I always do my reminder on Facebook and social media to just breathe. Um, I think sometimes personally, when I felt stuck, uh, there were many times in my life where my breath was short and I was very unaware uh, because I felt like I needed to do something absolutely right now to get unstuck, to get where ultimately sometimes sitting, just breathing a few times allows me to not necessarily resolve everything, but it does often, if not always, bring me a little bit more clarity uh, on what I can do next. So it's an invitation, as always, to just breathe. Uh, throughout your day, throughout your challenges, throughout the beautiful stuff. And I hope you all have a great rest of the evening and week and that we see you next Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, live on Facebook and all our episodes live on our YouTube channel, youngadultcancer.ca. Thank you again so much, Bonnie. And uh, we'll talk again, I'm sure, soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay. Take care.